read to you this morning Psalm 78. Psalm 78, I'm uh, going to read only portions of it right now, and then we'll read the entirety of it uh, during the sermon. I want to read verses 1 through 11, and then pick it up at verses 65 through the end of the psalm. A contemplation of Asaph. Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, telling to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he has done. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children, that the generation to come might know them, the children who would be born, that they may arise and declare them to their children, that they may set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments, and may not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not set its heart aright and whose spirit was not faithful to God. The children of Ephraim, being armed and carrying bows, turned back in the day of battle. They did not keep the covenant of God. They refused to walk in his law and forgot his works and his wonders that he had shown them. In verse 65, Then the Lord awoke as from sleep, like a mighty man who shouts because of wine, and he beat back his enemies. He put them to a perpetual reproach. Moreover, he rejected the tent of Joseph and did not choose the tribe of Ephraim, but chose the tribe of Judah, Mount Zion, which he loved. And he built his sanctuary like the heights, like the earth which he has established forever. He also chose David his servant and took him from the sheepfolds, from following the ewes that had, that had young he brought him. Uh, to shepherd Jacob his people and Israel his inheritance. So he shepherded them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them by the skillfulness of his hand. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us give thanks. Father, we thank you for your mercy and your grace toward us. We pray that you and your kindness and your mercy would give us wisdom and understanding as we study it. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <coughs> well, we appreciate your uh, patience as we uh, try to get situated to... Uh, a new spot here, and uh, no doubt you'll have to be patient with me as I preach and I try to read my notes way down there. Uh, I'm going to have to print it in a bigger font next week. Uh, I'm getting old. Uh, the Apostle Paul uh, remarks in a sermon to the Jews of Antioch that after King David had served the purpose of God in his generation, he died. Right? This is Acts chapter 13, verse 36. David served the purpose of God in his generation, and then he died. God raised David up to accomplish his purposes in David's life, and then David entered his rest. And I find that encouraging. It reminds us that we too are called to serve God's purpose in our generation, and then enter our rest. We are not to pine for the past, nor be complacent, in the present, nor wish we had been born sometime in the future. God has placed us here in this cultural moment to accomplish his purposes in our generation. Right, so what is it that enables us to navigate our cultural moment, right? This moment in which God has placed us. Often, I fear that we allow current events to overshadow the great biblical drama of creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. Right? We are, we are tempted, in other words, to interpret the biblical story in light of our current cultural moment. However, Scripture teaches us to do just the opposite. Scripture teaches us to interpret our cultural moment in light of of God's unchanging character, his unchanging story, his unchanging purposes. 
right? God remains faithful even when men, indeed even when his people, are unfaithful. And so our calling is to interpret our cultural moment in light of God's unchanging character and God's unchanging purpose. Right? That's our calling. And that calling has characterized God's people from the beginning. Right? So Asaph models how to do that in Psalm 78. Asaph models how to interpret our current cultural moment in light of God's unchanging purposes. So Psalm 78 uh, appears to have been written after David rose to power and laid plans for building the temple in Jerusalem. Asaph was wrestling with how these events, right? God choosing the tribe of Judah, God choosing the city of Jerusalem. How is that consistent with what had happened in the past? After all, right, if we look back at the past, it appeared that Ephraim would be the royal tribe and that Shiloh would be God's dwelling place. Right? The patriarch Jacob, recall, had recognized Ephraim as his firstborn. Remember his blessing when he switches his hands. And then he gave Joseph a double portion so that two of Joseph's sons end up becoming tribes in Israel. And uh, Jacob blessed Ephraim and anointed him as his firstborn. The privilege, the one who would inherit Jacob's blessing. And when the people of Israel came into the promised land, the tabernacle was set up at Shiloh. And Shiloh was in the midst of the tribe of Ephraim, in the midst of Ephraim's inheritance. But now, David's king. And David's from the tribe of Judah. He's not from the tribe of Ephraim. And the tabernacle's going to be erected. The temple is going to be built in Jerusalem. And that's not in Ephraim either. That's within the tribe of Judah. How is that consistent with God's faithfulness? How is that consistent with what has happened in the past? How do we apply the word of God to our current cultural questions? That's what Asaph was wrestling with. That's what Psalm 78 sings about and teaches you how to do I divided this psalm into three sections in verses 1 through 4. Asaph summons us to give heed to his instruction, to listen to what he's going to say to us. Uh, in verses 5 through 8, he explains why we should listen to him. Uh, he explores the biblical foundation for listening to those who have gone before us. Uh, then in verses 9 through 72, he explains how the scriptures help us understand Ephraim's rejection. Why has God rejected Ephraim and chosen Judah? So we began in verses 1 through 4 with Asaph's summons. Notice our text. Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, telling to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he has done. All right, notice in our text that Asaph summons all Israel to listen to what he has to say, verse 1. And note that Asaph has owned God's law and he's made it his own, right? Because what are we to listen to? You're to listen to my law, Asaph says, right? It, he, he promises then to tell us important things, truths that will require us to pay attention to him. They're like precious jewels mined from deep and dark caverns of the earth. Verse 2. Matthew, the gospel, declares that these verses were fulfilled in the life and teachings of our Lord Jesus. Matthew 13, verses 34 and 35. Matthew writes, says all these things Jesus spoke to the multitude in parables and without a parable he did not speak to them that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet by Asaph in this psalm saying 
I will open my mouth in, a par in parables. I will utter things kept secret from the foundation of the world. Asaph, in other words, was inspired by the spirit of Christ. He was a prophet. In this psalm, therefore, Jesus himself summons us to give heed to him, to listen to his law, to listen to his precepts and commandments. He used parables to speak truths that required people to pay attention, to meditate, and to reflect. He did not offer pablum. He did not offer baby food, but solid food. And he called his hearers to listen, right? He who has ears to hear, let him hear. I give heed to the words of my mouth. These parables and dark sayings are truths that were given to Asaph and to Jesus and indeed to all Israel, to all the people of God. Notice verse 3, we, right? Verse 3, which we have heard and known uh, and our fathers have told us. Uh, these dark sayings, in other words, weren't novelties. They weren't novelties. They were ancient truths. And so Asaph, in turn, pledges that all Israel will declare them to the next generation. Notice verse 4. We will not hide them from their children, telling to the generation to come. Right When we sing this psalm, when we sing Psalm 78, when we read this psalm, uh, we join this pledge. We promise and covenant to impart the precious truths given to us to the next generation, right? For whose children are they, right? Whose children are our children? They are their children. And who are they? They're the fathers. Our children, in other words, are given to us in trust. They aren't our children, right? They're children of the fathers. And indeed, not only are they children of the fathers, ultimately our children are <coughs> children of God. And given to us in trust that we might shepherd them and instruct them and teach them the ways of the Lord. So notice what we are to entrust to them in verse 4, uh, that we're to entrust to them the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he has done. We're to recount to our kids God's mighty acts in creation, in history, and in song. All right, so that's verses 1 through 4. So why, Asaph summons us to listen to him, so why should we listen to him, right? Why should we listen to him? It's this question that verses 5 through 8 answer. Notice verse 5. For God established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children, that the generation to come might know them, the children who would be born, that they may arise and declare them to their children, that they may set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments and may not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not set its heart aright and whose spirit was not faithful to God. So the reason that Asaph summons us to listen to him, the reason that Jesus summons us to listen to him, is because God has created the world in such a way that fathers are to teach their children so that those children can grow up and teach their children so that those children can grow up and teach their children, and so on, right? This is the way God has orchestrated and created the world. Remember uh, God's command, right? Verse 5 in uh, Psalm 78, uh, he says, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children. Remember Deuteronomy 6, verses 6 and 7. These words, which I command you today, shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. And you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. Right? The word of God is that which has been imparted to us. God has given us his word, his precepts, his ordinances. And our responsibility as parents then is to teach those diligently to our children, to impart them to the next generation. Again, so that our children then can rise up and teach them to their children. 
God revealed his testimony and law to our fathers, commanded our fathers to teach their children that we might know them, that God's word might enable us to understand our cultural moment and live faithfully in it. Right, this is, remember the setting. Asaph is setting us up to understand what he's going to go on in verses 9 through 72 to answer. So, uh, what is the purpose of our instruction? Notice that the purpose of our instruction is both positive and negative, verses 7 and 8. The purpose of our instruction is both positive and negative. Positively, we are to teach our children to set their hope in God, the first part of verse 7, and in the third part of verse 7, to keep his commandments. Right? We're to teach our children to place their hope in God. In other words, to have faith, to trust God, to believe him. And then secondly, to keep his commandments, to obey him. In other words, we are to teach our children faith and works. Because faith without works is dead. Right? We are to teach our children faith and works, to set their hope in God and to obey God. Is it enough to just obey some uh, abstract moral principles? Is that what we're to teach our children? No, because works without faith are dead. They are useless, and they will condemn you to hell. But faith and works join together, right? This is what we are to impart to our children, okay? To set their hope in God and to keep his commandments. And negatively then, notice the balancing portions, the second part of verse 7, uh, that we are to warn our children not to forget the works of God and then, in verse 8, not to be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation whose spirit was not faithful to God. So we're to warn our kids too, right? So our instruction is both positive and negative. In other words, the goal of our instruction is that our children walk faithfully with God and avoid the unfaithful, stubborn rebellion of past generations. After all, if you read scripture, you find that our fathers are not always faithful. Are we witnessing that in our day? Okay, so this is nothing new, right? Here's, so notice that verses 1 through 8 set out the principles. Asaph gets us ready for verses 9 through 72, right? All these verses is a long soul, okay? Um, God entrusted his law to his people, right? That's what God did. He revealed his law to his people through uh, the hands of Moses. He gave the Torah, right? And then he commanded the fathers to teach their children uh, so that we, their children, could in turn teach our children what it is to live as faithful men and women in our cultural moment. What does it mean to serve God in our day? Asaph summons us to listen to him because he's modeling how to apply God's law to his cultural moment. In the remainder of the psalm, He's endeavoring to help his generation answer questions which were pressing for their generation. We don't answer this question anymore. I mean, we don't, sorry. We aren't asking this particular question. But in Asaph's day, this was the burning question. Why had God chosen Judah to be the royal line when Jacob had made Ephraim his firstborn? Why had God rejected his dwelling place at Shiloh and chosen Mount Zion, Jerusalem instead. Was God being unfaithful? How does the word of God help Asaph answer these questions? Asaph crafts his answer uh, as a rhetorical sandwich. Okay? In verses 9 through 11, which I already read this morning, and then verses 65 through 72, he addresses these questions directly. 
right? He starts talking about Ephraim and Ephraim's unfaithfulness in verses 9 through 11. And then in verses 65 through 72, he explains what the consequence of that is. Then in between those verses, he explains why what has happened is consistent with the character of God and consistent with God's law. So that's what's going to happen. Let's look first at the sandwich. I have the bread, right, on other, either side. He starts addressing Ephraim in verses 9 through 11. Notice what he says. The children of Ephraim, being armed and carrying bows, turned back in the day of battle. They didn't keep the covenant of God. They refused to walk in his law and forgot his works and his wonders that he had shown them. So notice that Asaph begins with a description of Ephraim's response to God's word following their entrance into the promised land. In short, Ephraim was unfaithful. Ephraim was unfaithful. When Joshua sent them north to seize their inheritance, though they were armed and carrying bows, in other words, they were well armed and they were equipped, God didn't shortchange them in some way. Though they were armed and carrying bows, they failed to drive out the Canaanites as God had commanded them to do. They turned back in the day of battle. They were cowardly. Joshua records in Joshua chapter 16, verse 10. He says, And Ephraim did not drive out the Canaanites who dwelt in Gezer, but the Canaanites dwell among the Ephraimites to this day and have become forced laborers. This was an act of unfaithfulness. So why did Ephraim fail? We'll notice that Asaph tells us, verse 10, they did not keep the covenant of God. They broke covenant with God. They were unfaithful to him. They did not remember his word and his promises. They refused to walk in his law, right? They made excuses for their disobedience and they forgot his works. They forgot everything that he had done in Egypt and the way in which he could empower them to fulfill his word if they would only trust him and his wonders that he had shown them. This was Ephraim's unfaithfulness. So what was the result of their unfaithfulness? Did their unfaithfulness undermine God's faithfulness? Absolutely not. The unfaithfulness of men does not compromise the faithfulness of God. So what happened? Well, this brings us to the other end of the rhetorical sandwich in verses 65 through 72. Here, Asaph applies the biblical lessons that he's going to describe in verses 12 through 64. So notice verses 65 through 72. Then the Lord awoke as from sleep like a mighty man who shouts because of wine. And he beat back his enemies. He put them to a perpetual reproach, right? Even though Ephraim was unfaithful, imitating the unfaithfulness of Israel generally, even though Ephraim was unfaithful, God was faithful. He vindicated his name in the face of his enemies, right? So how did he do that? Verse 67. Moreover, he rejected the tent of Joseph and did not choose the tribe of Ephraim. He rejected them. He did not choose them as the royal tribe, but chose the tribe of Judah, verse 68. Mount Zion, right? Jerusalem, which he loved. And he built his sanctuary like the heights. He had cast off Shiloh already, like the earth, which he's established forever. He also chose David, his servant, and took him from the sheepfolds, from following the ewes that had young, he brought him to shepherd Jacob, his people, and Israel, his inheritance. So he shepherded them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them by the skillfulness of his hands. Right, Ephraim was unfaithful, but God remained faithful. He rejected Ephraim, and he chose the tribe of Judah. He rejected Shiloh, and he chose Mount Zion. He raised up David to shepherd his people according to his skillfulness. So why did God do all these things? Because the unfaithfulness of some of God's visible covenant people does not thwart the faithfulness of God to his promises. In the words of Jesus in John chapter 15, God cares for his vine. God cares for his vine. 
When necessary, he cuts out unfruitful branches in order that the vine might continue to flourish and grow. He cut off Ephraim and he chose Judah because he is faithful. So is that consistent with God's covenant? Is that consistent with his law? Is it consistent with his character? Absolutely. And it's this that the intervening verses, verses 12 through 64, demonstrate. Ephraim should have known better. They should have walked by faith and trusted God's promises and walked in obedience to his law. They should have known that if they rebelled against God, then God would most certainly discipline them and cut them off. <coughs> they should have known better than to presume upon God's grace to treat God's kindness with contempt. Why? Right? Why should they have known that? Why should you know that? Why should we as Trinity Church know that? Why should America know that? First, Ephraim should have known this because they would have read and heard how God had disciplined the Exodus generation. Notice verses 12 through 31. Right, so there's three different demonstrations that Asaph gives. God disciplined the Exodus generation, he disciplined the wilderness generation, and he disciplined the conquest generations. So guess what Ephraim should have known? He would discipline them too. God is faithful. Notice verse 12. Marvelous thing God did in the sight of their fathers. Whose fathers? Ephraim's father. Right? Marvelous things. God did in the sight of their fathers in the land of Egypt, in the field of Zoan. He divided the sea and caused them to pass through, and he made the waters stand up like a heap. In the daytime, he also led them with a cloud, and at night, all the night, with a light of fire. He split the rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink in abundance like the depths. He also brought streams out of the rock and caused waters to run down like rivers. And of course, God's people were faithful and they loved him and they didn't disobey him at all, right? <laughs> Verse 17, but they sinned even more against him by rebelling against the Most High in the wilderness. And they tested God in their hearts by asking for the food of their fancy. Yes, they spoke against God. They said, can God prepare a table in the wilderness? Behold, he struck the rock so that the waters gushed out and the streams overflowed. But can he give bread also? Can he provide meat for his people? <laughs> Therefore, the Lord heard this and he was furious. And so a fire was kindled against Jacob, and anger also came up against Israel, because they didn't believe in God, and they didn't trust in his salvation. They didn't trust God. They didn't believe him. Yet he had commanded the clouds above, and he had opened the doors of heaven. He had rained down manna on them to eat and given them of the bread of heaven. Men ate angels' food. He sent them food to the full. He caused an east wind to blow in the heavens, and by his power he brought in the south wind. He also rained meat on them like the dust, feathered fowl like the sand of the seas, and he let them fall in the midst of their camp all around their dwellings. So they ate and were filled, for he gave them their own desire. You were not deprived of their craving, but while their food was still in their mouths, the wrath of God came against them and slew the stoutest of them and struck down the choice men of Israel. Ephraim should have known better than to be unfaithful to God because what happened to the Exodus generation? God was kind to them. God saved them. God delivered them from Egypt, brought them through the Red Sea. He provided a water from the rock. He provided manna. He provided quail from heaven. And yet they rebelled against him. And what did God do? He killed the stoutest of them. And he acted against them in his fury. And yet Ephraim thought, hey, we can disobey God. We can disregard God's covenant. We can rebel against God and we'll be fine. That's not 
the way God works with his people. <coughs> but that's not all. The story continues. Ephraim should, not, should have learned not only from God's discipline of the Exodus generation, but also from his discipline of the wilderness generation. After all, right, did our fathers learn to praise God's forgiving mercy and fear his justice after he had struck the stoutest of them down on their way to the promised land? So when they got to the land and they sent the spies into the land and the spies came back, they listened to Joshua and Caleb, right? They didn't listen to the bad report. And they rebelled against God again. So what did God do? Verse 32. In spite of this, they still sinned and did not believe in his wondrous works. Therefore, their days he consumed in futility and their years in fear. Scattered them in the wilderness. He judged them and fulfilled his promises through their offspring. Right? God was faithful. He demonstrated his faithfulness by disciplining them and protecting their kids for whose sake they claimed they were being, they didn't want to go into the land. We got to protect our kids, God. So we're going to compromise and we're going to rebel against you. God's judgment upon that wilderness generation, right, produced a momentary change, right? They, they suddenly decided, oh, yeah, we were wrong to rebel, so we're going to go in now. But Israel, really at heart, was persistently unfaithful. Despite God's persistent faithfulness. Notice he continues in verse 34. When God slew them, then they sought him. And they returned and sought earnestly for God. And they remembered that God was their rock and the most high God, their redeemer. Nevertheless, verse 36, they flattered him with their mouth. They lied to him with their tongue. For their heart was not steadfast with him. Nor were they faithful in his covenant. They didn't keep covenant with God. They didn't trust him. But he, and look at God's grace, but he, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity. He didn't destroy them. Yes, many a time he turned his anger away and did not stir up all his wrath. For he remembered that they were but flesh, a breath that passes away and does not come again. How often they provoked him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert, right as they were wandering around. Yes, again and again, they tempted God and they limited the Holy One of Israel. They didn't remember his power, right? They forgot everything that he had done in Egypt. And so now Asaph recounts all that God had done for them. They didn't remember his power the day when he redeemed them from the enemy, when he worked his signs in Egypt and his wonders in the fields of Zoan. He turned their rivers into blood and their streams that they should, could not drink. He sent swarms of flies among them, which devoured them, and frogs which destroyed them. He also gave their crops to the caterpillar and their labor to the locust. He destroyed their vines with hail and their sycamore trees with frost. He also gave up their cattle to the hail and their flocks to fiery lightning. He cast on them the fierceness of his anger, wrath, indignation, and trouble. By sending angels of destruction among them, he made a path for his anger. He did not spare their soul from death, but gave their life over to the plague. And he destroyed all the firstborn in Egypt, the first of their strength in the tents of Ham. But he made his own people go forth like sheep, and he guided them in the wilderness like a flock. God was faithful to them. God had redeemed them. He had humbled the pride of the most powerful nation on earth for the sake of his people. Yet they had been unfaithful. Not only this, not only did he bring them out of Egypt, he also brought them into the Holy Land. Right? Verse 54. He brought them to his holy border. This mountain, which his right hand had acquired. He also drove out the nations before them, allotted them an inheritance by survey, and made the tribes of Israel dwell in their tents. God was faithful. So Ephraim should have known better than to presume upon God's grace. Because what did God do to the wilderness generation? When they rebelled against him, 
there in sight of the land of promise, sent them into the wilderness. They had to wander in the wilderness and die. <clears throat> so what happened then? What happened when the Israelites entered the promised land, right? God, uh, in his grace and mercy, brought them into the land. Were the Israelites faithful? Did they learn their lesson? Did they remain faithful to God? No. Right during the conquest of the land, our fathers continued to turn aside from God. And God handed them over to their enemies, even rejecting his dwelling place at Shiloh and handing the Ark of the Covenant into the hands of the Philistines. Notice verse 56. Yet they tested and provoked the Most High God. They did not keep his testimony, but they turned back. And they acted unfaithfully like their fathers. They were turned aside like a deceitful bow. For they provoked him to anger with their high places. They began worshiping idols. They moved him to jealousy with their carved images. When God heard this, he was furious. And he greatly abhorred Israel so that he forsook the tabernacle of Shiloh, the tent that he had placed among men. And he delivered his strength. That is the Ark of the Covenant. He just delivered his strength into captivity and his glory, another word for the Ark of the Covenant, into the enemy's hands. Remember, they put it in the temple of Dagon. And then, of course, God vindicated his name, right? But he vindicated his name because he's faithful, not because Israel was faithful. He also gave his people, verse 62, over to the sword. This is basically describing the book of Judges here. And he was furious with his inheritance. The fire consumed their young men, and their maidens were not given in marriage. Their priests fell by the sword, and their widows made no lamentation. Israel was unfaithful. They worshipped other gods, so God's anger was aroused by their idolatry, and he forsook the tabernacle at Shiloh. He even granted that the Philistines capture the Ark of the Covenant and set it up in the Temple of Dagon. God gave his people, both young men and maidens, uh, priests and commoners, over to their enemies. And yet Ephraim thought that they could break covenant with God, that they could be unfaithful to God, and God would say, ah, it's all right. Were God's decisions to forsake Shiloh and select Jerusalem, to cut off Ephraim and to choose Judah, consistent with God's covenant and God's character? Absolutely. Were they consistent with his law? Asaph has just demonstrated that it is consistent with his character. Yes. God's dealings with the Exodus generation, the wilderness generation, and the conquest generations demonstrates that God's faithfulness continues even when he disciplines the unfaithfulness of his people. When members of God's covenant people become corrupt, then God acts to cut them off from his covenant and fulfill his promises through others. Hence, Ephraim should have known that if they rebelled against God, then God would discipline them and cut them off and choose another tribe. They should have given heed to the dark sayings of old and the revelation of God's purposes in the Torah. They should have applied the word of God more faithfully to their cultural moment, even as Asaph is teaching us to do in our cultural moment. So, Here's the lesson for us. Here's the lesson for us. God's faithfulness overcomes even the unfaithfulness of his visible church. God's faithfulness overcomes even the unfaithfulness of God's visible covenant people. The unfaithfulness of men does not thwart the faithfulness of God. God is not dependent on his people. We are dependent <coughs> on him. God is not dependent on his people. We are dependent upon him. When members of his visible church, when members of his covenant people become corrupt, then God will cut them off from his covenant and fulfill his promises through others. Was this not precisely what Jesus announced to ethnic Israel in his day? Many Jews believe, perhaps like some Ephraimites in Asaph's day, God must favor us. 
because he has promised. We have Abraham for our father. And Jesus says to them in Matthew chapter 21, verse 43, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a nation bearing the fruit of it. Or as John the Baptist preached to them in his ministry, do not think to say to yourselves, we have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. Matthew chapter 3, verse 9. All right, so what happened to the Jews and John's and Jesus' day? <coughs> Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans. The temple was razed to the ground. And the new Jerusalem, the church of Jesus Christ, consisting of both Jews and Gentiles, arose from the ashes and has since been the center of God's work on earth. That's what happened. Why? Because God is faithful even when his covenant people are unfaithful. Now, even as Jesus and John warned the Jews in their day, so God is warning the West in our day, right? God has been gracious to Western civilization. The West has been like Shiloh, a place of God's blessing, a place where God made his presence known in peace, abundance, and civilizational advance. But guess what happened to Shiloh? God abandoned it. Guess what happened to earthly Jerusalem? God abandoned it. Why? Because of Ephraim's unfaithfulness. Because of Israel's unfaithfulness. So what will happen to the West if we refuse to repent? If we return from God and worship idols? If we imitate Ephraim's unfaithfulness? Right? Are God's purposes so tied to the West and to America that he will fail to subdue the nations without our help? <laughs> By no means. Right? If we do not repent, then the West, like Shiloh, like Ephraim, like Jerusalem in Jesus' day, like Hagia Sophia in Istanbul, like many churches in Europe, will be cut off. God does not need us. We need him. God is not dependent upon us. We are dependent upon him. Finally, that which was true of Jerusalem in Jesus' day, and that which is true of the West, is also true of particular churches and denominations. God is not dependent on any specific local church or any association of churches to accomplish his purposes in human history. God is not dependent upon any specific local church or any association of churches to accomplish his purposes in human history. He often cuts specific churches off. He often removes them from his olive tree and casts them on the burn pile of history. So what's that mean for us? What's that mean for us? That we must give heed to the word of God and be faithful. That we must place our hope in God and keep the commandments of God and not turn away from his commandments or imitate the disobedience of our fathers. Remember Jesus' warnings to the churches in Revelation. In Revelation 2 and 3, consider his warning to Ephesus. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 5, remember, therefore, he says to the church in Ephesus, remember from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Ephesus is no more. His words to Sardis in Revelation chapter 3, verse 3. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. Jesus judges his people. Laodicea, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish that you were cold or hot, that you had some purpose, some use. 
So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. God's visible church, right, is often compromised, often corrupted, often infiltrated by wolves and sheep's clothing. Right, so what's our consolation? Right, what's our consolation in the midst of such compromise and corruption? Our comfort is that God's faithfulness overcomes even the unfaithfulness of his visible church. Right, God's dealings with our fathers following the exodus, during the wilderness wandering, amid the conquest of the promised land, and through the ministry of our Lord Jesus, demonstrate the un that the unfaithfulness of men does not thwart the faithfulness of God. Right? When, when members of God's visible church become corrupt, then God acts. God acts to vindicate his name, to cut them off from his covenant and fulfill his promises through others. He brings down a Leo and he raises up a Luther. This is what God does. And he's doing the same thing in our day. He is using the sexual revolution to disrupt his church and to separate the wheat from the chaff, the sheep from the goats. He will purify his church. He will glorify his name. So our, what's our calling then? In the midst of that, right? In the midst of God shaking the world, shaking his church, our calling is to imitate Asaph. It's to be faithful to God, to love him, to trust him, to set our hope in God, and to teach our children to do the same. To meditate deeply upon God's word and remain faithful to Christ in our cultural moment. As we come to this table, may we remember that the only one who can enable us to walk in faith and faithfulness is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He must strengthen us and empower us by his spirit through his word and sacraments. And so let us pray that he would do these very things, that we might tell the generations to come the praises of the Lord, his might, and the wonders that he has wrought. Let us pray together. Our God and our Father, we thank you that you are faithful, that you are faithful generation after generation. We praise you that you have given us life and salvation in Jesus, that you have demonstrated your faithfulness generation upon generation, and that the unfaithfulness of your people does not compromise your faithfulness nor thwart your purposes in the world. You will cause the nations to bow before your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. In him, all the families of the earth will be blessed. You will teach the nations righteousness and justice and equity and every good way. So we rejoice in your goodness, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Amen.